Western Wall, or the Wailing Wall, as it's sometimes called, is the most sacred place to the Jewish people today because it's all that's left of what once was the complex of the Second Temple. is not just a miracle worker, he is God. Because only God can command nature, and only God could still a storm. Jesus says very clearly in this passage, nobody knows the time. So don't waste your time trying to guess the time. Be ready all the time because I could come at any time. you follow that. Um, I might have my dad's personality, but Christy has his brains. So, This past week, um, every morning when I would wake up, the Holy Spirit would bring to my mind 2 Corinthians 5.8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And as you've heard everyone share today, there is no fear in death. We know exactly where dad is. He is in heaven. He is not sad. We're just sad we're not there with him. As I look at your faces in this room, I know all of you loved and felt loved by my dad. He knew how to love big. He knew how to speak life and believe in everyone. From the time I was a little girl, he would tuck us in bed every night and tell us how proud he was of us. He would pray over us. He would speak life to us. What a gift. Our family travels and speaks, and we meet so many people that we pray with that have a hard time picturing a heavenly father that they can trust. But when you have an earthly father that you could trust and that loved you so much, it's easier to believe in a heavenly father that you can trust. And that was a gift that my dad gave to each one of us. He helped us believe in the heavenly father that we could trust forever. Um, my dad's top priority in life, he said it over and over again, he just wanted to serve God. That's what motivated him. He had that unique ability to take complicated things and help us all understand God's word. I think that's what probably all of us in this room remember him for. He could make it memorable with his voices and with his stories. He made it experiential. He made it come to life. This past week, um, I've gotten thousands of messages from people that were his students or watched him at the King is Coming online. And over and over again, they said the same thing. Your dad was my favorite teacher. He taught me to love the Old Testament. He helped the Bible come alive. And that's what dad did. 
He was our walking Bible commentary. I think Josh said that. Um, there were so many times that I was teaching Bible study, and I would call him the night before, and I'd say, Dad, I want to say this, this, and this, and I just want to make sure if it's theologically correct or not. And um, I'm going to miss that so much because we could call him any time, and he would keep us on track, and he would say all the time, keep it simple. People can only retain so much. Keep it simple and say the most important thing. And I love that about him, how he kept it simple. I realized when we were in Israel with him, he took our whole family a couple times, that he had a photographic memory. You know, when you live with someone, you just take it for granted. And as we walked around Israel, the historical facts that just flowed out of him, I think Josh would sit with them in the front and everywhere we went, even places we weren't stopping at, it was just flowing out of him. This is where this happened. This is where that happened. He only had a photographic memory when it came to history, and God's word is history. It was unbelievable. But a fun fact that probably most of you don't know about him is he never used a computer, and he never typed. He wrote every book, handwritten, all 40 books. When we were little growing up, John and I were talking about that. We watched him in the basement in his office he would speak his books out loud into this recorder. And then when dad wasn't down there, John would go and record his songs on that same recorder. <laughs> so whoever was typing dad's books, they would get a few songs every now and then. His mind was so brilliant that he had this capacity. He didn't use modern technology like the rest of us use. He would print out the emails and handwrite a response and someone would type it for him. It was amazing. After serving God, serving God was always his top priority. His second priority was his family. You know, lots of men have great hobbies and fun hobbies like golf and fishing and um, sports. My dad's hobby was his family. That gave him the most joy. Family vacations, I'll never forget. Um, Andy would laugh every year because Papa would call us Dad would call us a whole year in advance and say, what are you doing next year for Christmas? What are you doing next year for July 4th? And he wanted to get on the calendar um, and make sure every single family member could be there. It didn't have to be on the exact day, but it had to be some time that we could all get together. Growing up, my dad never traveled. When he went to college, he, he had maybe been to Ohio one time. He lived in Detroit. And so he made sure that he took all of us overseas on mission trips when he spoke. He wanted to give us a heart for the world. He wanted us to love the world and see the world. And I'm so thankful for that gift. Many of you in this room remember back in 2008, 14 years ago, when my father had the quadruple bypass and Jonathan, Pastor Jonathan's right, they have him in the same room in ICU as he was 14 years ago. How many of you in this room prayed for him back then? And we saw a miracle of after he lay there almost in a coma state for three months, God brought him back. And what impressed me so much, the night before he went back in for his second surgery, to get the fluid out of his lungs. He had just led his nurse to Christ, and he was so weak. This was 14 years ago. He could hardly speak. And I'm feeding him jello because he couldn't even lift up the spoon. And you know, I had never prayed a conversational prayer with my dad before. This was the first time because he'd pray his own prayers, but I. I would say a few sentences and then he'd say a word or two because that's all that he had the energy or the breath to do. And I will never forget as long as I live when he had his last breath before that surgery as I'm feeding him, he just said, Lord, I just want to serve you. It wasn't God heal me for me. He just wanted to serve God. That was his heart. And I will never forget that. And all of us in this room that prayed for him, God brought him back the last 14 years. And there is something that we did not realize. 
But as Allie is in nursing school and able to help us this last week or two look at all his paperwork and all his records, the past 14 years, he was living with a heart that only worked at half capacity of a normal heart. Think of what God allowed him to accomplish the past 14 years with half the capacity of a normal heart. He was basically working four jobs. He was the de Dean of Divinity at Liberty University. He was teaching on the King is Coming World Prophetic Ministry TV show. He was writing multiple books. He just finished his last Bible this week that he worked on for a couple years editing. I mean, it's just amazing all that he was doing with half the capacity. And so we did all get our miracle. God's given it to him the last 14 years. This past year, his heart started to decline so much, and most of you in this room didn't realize that. And mom was so good at helping dad. In God's grace, I think the last place he flew to speak at a big event, it was to a thousand Calvary Chapel pastors. Andy went to help him because he couldn't carry anything and he could barely walk. But when he got in the pulpit to speak, no one knew how frail he was. And he was exhorting those thousand Calvary Chapel pastors. His last sermon in person was right here at Thomas Road Baptist Church just a few months ago. And his last public prayer was at Josh and Brooke's wedding. God is so good. Dad's last two days on earth, as you've been hearing about, were a huge blessing to us, that God would allow him to speak to us again. We just wanted to hear his voice. And when they pulled out the ventilator, as Christy said, he was saying, unbelievable. And he was just saying, wow, wow, over and over. And we don't know what happened. We don't know what kind of spiritual experience he had, but he thought he died and came back. And it was such a gift for him to bless each one of us. And he was speaking so much truth in those moments. And we started videoing and writing down as fast as we could. And I just want to share a couple of the things I wrote down. He said, again, he said, all I want to do is serve God. And then he said, if the miracle doesn't happen, he is still God. He said, I asked for two, and that's a lot. When God comes for us, it is eternal life forever. There is a time when life ends and we all have to be ready to go. You have to trust God and believe in him. What, then he said, heaven is real. Hell is real. He was giving the gospel to us in those last moments. That was true to who he was. And in those final hours, he was so weak. His, his little body was so frail and so bruised. And there was barely any oxygen going to his brain. Barely any blood flow. And I just prayed over him. We saw this in Jen so many times. I said, Holy Spirit, you are alive in Dad, and you're alive in us. And even though dad's body is broken, the Holy Spirit is not disabled. The Holy Spirit is alive and perfect. And God allowed my dad to, we, um, when they knew he was dying, they allowed our whole family to come and circle his bed in ICU. And for over three hours, we sang his favorite hymns. Sometimes mom was doing a verse we didn't know, and he'd say, keep it simple. <laughs> My dad could not carry a tune, but he was singing. And we started singing, we are standing on holy ground. And I know that there are angels all around. And my dad, with his frail arms and all the tubes and all the black and blue, started raising his hands up to heaven as he sang. And I have never seen him do that before. He was worshiping. And we sang his favorite hymn, Victory in Jesus. When he told us to keep it simple, I started singing Jesus Loves Me. 
And when we could tell, I mean, this went on for three hours. I kept looking at the clock saying, Lord, you're so good. And when we could tell that there wasn't going to be probably any more words come out, we just were around his bed, and we just wanted one last word. And he was saying, die for the truth, but we're like, Papa, I think Christy said, if you could leave us with one final thing, what do you want us to know? And we recorded it, and Brooke was writing it all down for us, and he said, the world is a big place. And there are a lot of hurting people. And this was his challenge. Be willing to sacrifice your life for the cause of Christ. And I want to challenge every one of you in this room. Are you willing to sacrifice your life for the cause of Christ? Are you doing things that matter for eternity? We look at my dad laying here, and his body is dead, but his spirit is alive. And all that's left is the legacy that he passed on to his family and to everyone else. In this room, everyone he taught, everything he wrote, it was all about Jesus. You know, we don't have to, if you're sitting here today, you don't have to be a teacher. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to start a ministry. God wants to use you just right where you're planted. He wants to use you as you are to be a light for him. And if you ask God, he will bring people into your path every day who are desperate for hope and desperate to know that God loves them. And my challenge to you is, are you willing to share the gospel? Are you willing to leave a legacy with your family and with everyone you know, the people at work, the people in your neighborhood? Are you willing to leave something that will outlive you and last forever? Did you know God created all of us with this huge desire to have a purpose greater than ourselves? And God wants to use every one of you in this room to change the world for 